Now, a lot of you have a lot of experience being students, and the point is to not get a D or a C. The point has been how to avoid failure, and everything is about to change in that respect because now you're entering an arena where failure is normal and expected. Uh, if you go into an interview with the aim of avoiding failure, uh, you will probably do well. You'll, you may end up number 11 out of 300 applicants, and that's pretty good, but you won't have a job. Uh, so embrace this fact you are going to fail again and again and again, and embrace this further fact, failure doesn't matter. What matters is that one benighted journal out there that for some reason says yes at some point. What matters is that one weird search committee that says yes. So most candidates, you see, you know, if you're looking at it from Tyler's perspective or my perspective, they just seem not to have the self-confidence or the self-awareness or they don't trust interviewers enough to just spit out simple, clean, interesting sentences. The main reason why people, good people, come in number 11 rather than number one, it isn't affirmative action, it isn't uh, political bias. The main reason is that they're dull. Uh, so understand, it's your life. Uh, don't approach the job market like a lost lamb. Take charge. So for you, the, the, you have advisors, you have mentors, you have people who really care about you, but for you, this is the end of the world as you know it. But for your mentors, it's normal. They go through this every year. They wish you well. They really do. But they know from long experience it's not their problem. If they got worked up and lost sleep and you know, became insomniacs about your problem, it would ruin them because your situation well, their situation is having, stu having students in your situation. That never changes, not for them. It's not the end of the world as they know it. It's business as usual. So here's a hint. Uh, hiring committees are not looking for graduate students, not looking for good graduate students, not looking for graduate students that are in the top three of their class. They don't care about any of that. What they're looking for is professors, uh, assistant professors at the entry level. So your main competition will look like, your main competitors will look like assistant professors. Many of them actually will be. Uh, you think you're just looking around at, you know, like, I think I'm number one in my class. That person's clearly not number one. That's number two, number three. I'm better than them. And I'm at a top 10 school. So I, theoretically, I should get the 10th best job on the market. No, I mean, your, your competition will be people who've been out for a few years teaching. They have two books out from Oxford Press. That's who you're, that's who you're looking at. That's the competition. So no one cares, really, uh, how good a student you were. What they care about is how good a professor you're going to be. So act like a professor. Three aspects of that, I think, are in your control right now. Uh, and I'll call them passion, organization, and respect. This is, first thing, passion. This is a discussion of career strategy, largely. But my first bit of advice is pre-strategic. It's make sure there's a point in having a career strategy. You want to succeed. but you also want to deserve to succeed. The life of a scholar is a glorious life. You get to make a living by reading and thinking hard about what you've read. You walk into a classroom, you tell your students what you think, and they take notes. <laughs> Even better, if you have some passion for the material, uh, some of them will too. Uh, so will many of your students. Uh, even better, you go back to your office and write it up. You're in a rush about the feedback you got from your students. You write it up. You keep writing. You send it off. You get it published. And then someday, years later, while you're taking a break, you really shouldn't be, break, shouldn't be taking, but you take a break, and you Google that name of that article, thinking that it fell stillborn from the presses. You find out that it's been cited a 100 times. Pretty cool. Although, in passing, here's a word for the wise. However much fame you achieve, that's enough. 
Welcome it, but don't grasp at it. The less compelled you are to prove yourself in comparison terms, in comparison to that thing, person you judge number two, the easier it will be to feel peace. Being a scholar is hard. To get things done, you have to love the doing. So if you want to maintain your passion for work and you want people to be better off for having read your work or for having been your student, next serious piece of advice is uh, put on a scholarship ahead of your ideological commitments. Uh, that, I think, is you know, the sweet spot. Is, it's, really, it's really a slope. Um, so insist on truth. If the truth turns out to be incompatible with your agenda, change your agenda. It's a matter of being moral, of making sure you deserve to succeed, but it's also a prerequisite of being proud of whatever success you do happen to achieve. You have to do your work your way. But if you put your ideological commitments first, then in an important way the work isn't really yours. You've become a parrot for an ism, you won't succeed. You won't deserve to succeed, and even if you did, you wouldn't love it. When people begin to think that they know what you're going to say, they know where you're coming from, uh, if you ever find, you know, sometimes the words will come out of a person's mouth, well, as a utilitarian, I believe, there's no point in listening to what's coming next. As a libertarian, I believe, you know, that's, that's a signal I'm not interested, and you can stop listening now. Um, so don't do that. When you stop surprising people, even sim people with the same commitments will think less of you. So that's the first point. Don't become a parrot for an ism. Don't uh, put your ideological commitments first. But there is something worse than that, which is putting someone else's ideological commitments first. Uh, what a sad deplorable, contemptible thing it is to see people going native and coming to believe whatever the people around them believe and coming to believe it for the same reason that they came to believe it, namely just social pressure. You must meet your colleagues and your teachers halfway, maybe more than halfway, but you also have to do your work your way. Success isn't everything. It is not more important than deserving to succeed. You're not an island, though, and you wouldn't be doing your job if you were. Your job as a scholar is to communicate, not to talk to yourself. Therefore, to deserve to succeed, you must figure out what other people are saying and why. You must engage them, which means you must search for the truth in what they're saying. But the other part of deserving to succeed is that at the end of the day, you do have to be able to look back. When you're dying, you have to be able to look back on your life and say, here's what my career was for. These are the values I wouldn't compromise. And they were my values. They were not precipitates of an ideology or pre-packed uh, social pressure or anything like that. I did my work my way. I stood for something. It mattered that I was here. So take it for granted other people will see things differently and react differently. Some disapproval is inevitable, and it isn't fun, but neither is it a big deal. So summarizing the passion point, I want to say love what you do. Make sure you're doing something that will bring you joy if you succeed at it. If you don't work at stuff you love, you won't be able to compete anyway. Uh, an obvious point there, if you don't love to do things that lead to success in a given discipline, you're in the wrong discipline. In particular, you know, here's a cliche, you've heard it before, publish or perish. Think about how ironic that cliche is. I mean, as if there's some, I don't know, some sweet spot there. But, uh, you know, it depicts writing as the thing you have to do, as the cost of having a job. Writing is not the cost of being an academic. Writing is a reward. If it isn't something that you love to do, uh, the academy would be a bizarre career choice. It's a fantastic thing to have a chance to make a living as a professional scholar. I think it's near miraculous, think about it, 
to live in a civilization that would get to the point of being able to fly you across the ocean for a conference, build skyscrapers, or push the division of labor to a point where it's possible for a person to make a living as a full-time scholar. Now, needless to say, there are lots of airplanes and skyscrapers and professors who are duds. Uh, but that isn't the point. The point is, this is a profession that you're contemplating and it's a sacred calling. If some of your colleagues turn out to be mediocre or worse, it doesn't change the fact that this is a privilege that demands the absolute best within you. End of uh, the passion point. Organization. The downside of being a professor is that 5 p.m. never comes. There's no such thing as being done, no such thing as being caught up. Every day there will be more things to do that are worth doing than you will have time to do. More people worth helping than you'll be able to help. So one of your students, someone you barely know, comes to you and says she doesn't know who else to talk to. Her brother just committed suicide. The phone rings and a friend of yours, someone you didn't have time to write a recommendation letter for, uh, calls to let you know that he's been denied tenure. And then your doctor calls to say that that uh, mystery lump on your uh, x-ray, we need to do a biopsy, when can you come in? And as he hangs up, you see a line of people down the hall wanting to talk to you about their grades. Um, there, there will be days like that. Time and stress management are the keys to happiness and productivity in academics. Time pressure is the primary obstacle to professional success and also a primary obstacle to enjoying whatever success you achieve. So long as you're an academic, you will be caught in the middle of a war between what's urgent and what's important. So a bit of advice, uh, this will be hard advice to take, but you'll need to take it again and again and again. Don't be a coward. When it's wrong to say yes, say no. Above all, when things get busy, as in, they already are and it's just going to get worse. When things get busy, don't sacrifice research. Here's a nasty fact. Research is the most important thing on your agenda, professionally speaking, and at the same time, it's the least urgent. It's the easiest thing to sacrifice when things start piling up, even though it's far more important for your success than what's pushing it aside. This problem never solves itself. So here's a proposal. This may be my most important bit of concrete advice, which is use a weekly log to track your research time. I use a 20-hour weekly log. You need ongoing steady commitments to research daily, weekly, monthly, targets, whatever page commitments, time commitments, whatever. But I think time commitments work best, and I think weekly commitments work best. You have many days you can't control, but honestly, you won't have many weeks that you can't control sufficiently well to get your 20 hours in. Get up at 5 a.m. if necessary. Don't let everyday chaos gobble up those precious few hours where you do what you need to do to make progress and to feel the rush that comes from having created something. Corollary, live a full life. I use my log to define a maximum as well as a minimum commitment to research. Uh, in the form of an aphorism, earn breaks, then take them. Commit yourself to enjoying day-to-day -day life. Related point, don't dwell on waste. Don't worry about wasting time. Worrying about waste is a recipe for guilt. Waste is inevitable in academic life. What isn't inevitable is getting real work done. So that's the thing to focus on. If you can get up in the morning and put three hours into concentrated research, then it doesn't matter whether you waste three hours at the end of the day. So when I get up early and do my three hours, I get more done with less stress and I enjoy the rest of the day so I say make time for concentrated research on a daily basis uh, and certainly on a weekly basis.